The title of your film flows as both irony and destination. As those two feelings coexisted as you were creating the film, your journey of ascension, what was the most powerful intuition you experienced regarding how ascension is defined? When making this film, I was really trying to hold space to allow for two truths at once to coexist. So there's the truth of progress where millions of Chinese are lifted out of um, poverty due to the economic reforms that happened in um, 30, about 30 years ago. But there's also the truth of income inequality and exploitation that comes with that. Um, and the darker sides of this type of, of capitalism. So I was really in my, in my mind and in my heart trying to think of, of two truths at once, since I think that's true for a lot of people. And I also noticed, um, I had the feeling that ascension was true in a spiritual sense almost, where it feels like the creed of today's China for some people, can feel like making as much money as possible. And it manifests in a near religious sense where it gives people a sense of purpose, a sense of identity, a sense of striving. And I'm not here to make any moral judgments. Um, and it's understandable that um, making as much money as you can can seem like an escape given the past traumas of China. In the way you present the various occupations, there was a uselessness and helplessness regarding the pursuits in many ways. What truth did you find in observing the various laborers? And did you find that the workers themselves had turned off essential survival skills when in lockstep with the corporation? So China is obviously an incredibly vast country with so many different types of factories. The ones that we were, some are better than others in terms of their labor conditions. The one that the ones that we were filming in were um, were at the workplaces were much better than a lot of the ones that you don't see. So I didn't, even though it can feel um, a bit uneasy at times, I didn't actually feel that same sense of uselessness and helplessness. I was more thinking about trying to indict the consumers in the supply chain and see themselves as part of as part of that supply chain. So when you see something that looks um, useless and helpless in a factory, I'm hoping for the consumers to to see to implicate themselves. And a lot of it was about really um, really embracing an interconnectivity of of consumers and laborers. You use cinematic form in converting the mundane of activities to a flow of almost eureka art. How did that vision evolve through the shoot? What did you as a visual artist begin to understand that allowed for the stunning images you conveyed? That's a great question. My interest in the film was multifaceted and a big interest was the visual element because there's so many visual stunning um, just places that you'll see in China related to the supply chain. Um, so I think many of the things that I was filming to begin with lent themselves to being visually stunning. And I try to take that same eye and bring it to things that are not as immediately visually stunning. So for example, um, a live streamer selling a shoe that could be seen as a, when she's holding it up to her face, that could be seen as a pretty mundane image. But I was, I think, holding in all of those other kind of epic spaces that I was filming in and tried to shoot it with a similar eye, if that makes sense. I wanted to give the film more substance than just visuals. So I was trying to find myself in situations where people were conversing, um, ideas were being exchanged, dialogue. So that's part of why there was a lot of conferences or training, training centers. Um, and sometimes conferences are really boring to shoot. So I tried to make it all, but I tried to make it all fit into the same film. So I was trying to bring kind of like a stylistic way to filming these, what could be visually boring places. And, you know, some of it is, not as successful as others, but I think through editing, I just tried to make it not kind of fall flat. Uh, 
right. The sex doll worker sequence is one dripping with the most irony. Since sex is one of the most powerful motivators in the human condition, uh, able to topple both king and peasant, what do those sex dolls, and to a degree instant access to pornography, communicate about the state of sex in the 21st century? Interesting question. Um, I think I'm not sure how much the existence of these dolls are really an accurate barometer of sex today, but I think the fact of their existence definitely speaks to a disconnection from other humans and the people who the demand for them speaks to a need for this type of convenience that strips away messiness and joy of other people. Um, so it's when I, you know, looking at them, it's clearly catering towards the most base of male desires, fetishizing and dehumanizing the female form. Um, but I wonder how new any of that is since misogyny has always existed. Um, I think an interesting question that this film isn't really trying to answer, but just an interesting question in general is if the internet and porn culture has changed people's attitudes towards sex and created more of a demand for these kinds of dolls. But um, the film itself was really concerned with the process of the making and supplying of the sex dolls, not the consumers on the other end. Like, you know, I'm wondering what is it like for the workers who are making these dolls? Who, who are they? What are they talking about in their spare time? And what do they think about these dolls? Um, and in a way they become desensitized to them because it becomes just like any other product that you're making. And I think there's an interesting um, correlation where you could say that the consumers who are buying the dolls are desensitized to, to sex or to other humans as well. All right. The parallel that China has to the United States after World War II, the development of a distinctive upper and middle class that hadn't been available before is apparent. Do you anticipate that China will have the same blowback from their structure of now, much as the United States has suffered from their focus on the American dream? Um, I feel that inequality is an enormous issue in China, as in the States. Um, but it's also layered with the problem of human rights that come with living in a repressed society where people aren't always free or kind of ever free to criticize the leadership or speak freely. So I think in many ways, the promise of a better life materially can be a distraction for the indignities of living under authoritarian rule. Um, I think like a huge question that people are asking is what kind of blowback will China have and if it will have any blowback. It's been continuing like this for several years um, and longer than people thought. People felt like once China embraced um, free markets and open trade, that would lead to democracy, but of course it didn't. Um, but I'm not really one to predict. I think that what what's interesting to me is drawing the comparisons with the states to think about the ways in which um, material striving here also distracts us from civic engagement. Um, so I think our cultures are similar where we buy into this myth of personal transformation and fulfillment through having a materially better existence. Um, and I'm not talking about like being comfortable, but I'm talking about just this um, constant consumption, like fast fashion, um, having just quick turnaround times in terms of, um, having the newest outfits and things like that. Final question. You end the film with a poem excerpt from your great grandfather from 1912. Does it illustrate to you that the human condition doesn't change or that the artist will always observe what other people keep denying? Um, yeah, I, I found that it's interesting to look for parallels in this poem that was written um, almost a hundred years ago. And, and now, um, the poem was written during the fall of the last empire of China, which was the Qing dynasty. And the, the country then was on the brink of great uncertainty and redefining itself. So I agree that our, the human condition doesn't change. And of course our context do, um, but what remains for me was this similar sense of, um, in the poem, the narrator um, feels 
feels discouraged when he's able to reach a certain physical vantage point and can survey the land around um, because that perspective allows him to see the invading territories that are destroying his country that were, of course, then specific to the turmoil of the politics at that time. But um, I see a resonance today where the ascent of the ladder of capitalism, which we see as progress, um, doesn't have that kind of intended effect of eliminating worries, but can have the opposite effect where there's new unforeseen consequences like exploitation, environmental destruction, um, and so allowing us to witness the full extent of the kind of destruction that we've brought onto ourselves. This is Patrick McDonald for HollywoodChicago.com, copyright 2021.